Good morning, everybody. Jonathan Holmes. Bit of a rare breed compared to most of the people around here. And I'm an independent agronomist. I'm also an Albrecht soil scientist. And what I do is I help join up all the knowledge we've been sharing today with farmers that really, really want to change. So if you want to know anything about me, please have a look at my website. We need to learn more from the past. If you look at the ice cores from the Arctic and Antarctic, going back millennia, before the Industrial Revolution, there was only 275 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're up to some fairly scary levels now. We needed the Industrial Revolution, 1760, 1830, to get us all to where we are now. Farmers fed that. Does anybody grow potatoes? Just stick your hand up. Fantastic, well done. You actually fed the Industrial Revolution. Without the humble spud, that wouldn't have been possible and we wouldn't be here and we have all the technology we've got now that in the Victorian area, we exported to the rest of the world. Because the potato was the only transportable food source that when everybody left the countryside, went into the town. Major downside to that now, the CO2 levels, the methane levels in the atmosphere are really high, but we can look at how we can change that. The other thing is to think about is that potato famine. 1845, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yes, we know it was blight. We know that people in that area didn't have the chemistry or the knowledge we've got now. But the main reason that that happened was they're all growing the same variety of potatoes because it was convenient to the end processors. That was a variety called lumper. You think, yeah, well, probably didn't know that much now. We wouldn't repeat that mistake now. You know, unfortunately, I think we all probably eat bananas. The most widely grown variety of bananas is Cavendish. Sri Lanka's just been wiped out. There's a soil born, I think it's a virus, but stand to be corrected, that's completely wiped out the crop there and in America, South America, Australia, going around the world. So unfortunately, we're still doing some of the same things. Worldwide, there's 20,000 20, edible food crops. And yet, top four crops grown in the world feed 60% of the planet. Maize, rice, potatoes, wheat, or cereals. So we just need to think a little bit more about the world situation. Donald Rumsfeld, I've got a military background that most of you know, it gets in the way of everything I do. Uh, when he said that, most people didn't know what on earth he was talking about. <clears throat> so let's apply it to what I want to talk about today. It's two known knowns. If you guys aren't making money, and I mean increasing your gross margin, not just increasing your yields, increasing your gross margin, we're not going to save the planet. Those two go together. Because it won't be very many years when we won't be here, but the planet will be. We've got known unknowns. It's fantastic people over there. I know nothing about machinery. It's not my world. But you guys have got to do the up and down and round and round to actually get the crops in. But getting the right machinery in the right place, absolutely vital. The main thing I want to talk about is the unknown unknowns. Because in my experience, most farmers would like to know, but don't know about how soil actually works. And it's why I'm an Albrecht soil scientist. I work all over the UK. I did get offered a job in New Zealand, but I decided not to take it. Because getting the understanding of the soil then gives you more surety to get the right crop in the right place at the right time with the right bit of kit and increase your gross margin. So that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. That fairly spookily, ladies and gents, is what agronomy is. It's not that, which is unfortunately what it's sort of evolved into the last 20, 30 years. I know I'm preaching converted, but we need to remember it's the soil science bit you guys need and that's what I've been going around the country helping people to do. Because when you understand that or get a greater understanding of it, your decision-making process is much better. That's just, just to explain what I'm talking about with that. Um, I spend quite a lot of time analysing soils, working out the best way to get the right grass. In this instance, I work a lot with deer and horse environments to manage the sward for those people. So you find out what's happening in the soil, find out what the farmer's objectives are, find out the grass species you need to put in the middle, devise a mixture for them. There you are. Keep talking to them and get it sorted out. 
the number of times I've been on farms that farmers said, oh, you know that grass species you recommended, that mixture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I got it 50 pence cheaper from the chap down the road. Okay, fine. But he said, don't put Coxfoot in and don't put Timothy in because you don't need it. And you just lose the will to live because the other thing that we've got to think about, ladies and gents, and this is the crucial bit, we have got to get the architecture below ground that interacts with the soil so the bit above ground that we want can survive. Effectively, what we need to be doing is weatherproofing your soil. And if you think about it like that, it makes more sense. And I'll keep going on about weatherproofing your soil in a minute. The other one was, um, I was just saying about machinery. Getting the right bit of kit for your soil that matches your objectives is vital. We know that, but you've got to make it happen. Talking to farmers all the time and saying, look, just get somebody out with all their toys, get them to go up and down and right and up and down and see what machinery matches your soil type, go for it. Number of farms I've been on, oh, they offered me another 200 quid off if I bought it today, so I've got this one. Two years down the road, it's not quite the bit of kit you want. So doing things right is really important. This is exactly what I'm talking about, weatherproofing your soils. It's a, it's a good little mantra I have. If you think about the weather patterns in the UK a few years ago, absolutely persisting with rain all winter. We had about two weeks of spring and then it baked dry. Well, certainly in the grassland environments, unless you've got Coxfoot, which is deep rooting and doesn't care, it's got the same feed value, by the way, if anyone grows sheep or cattle, same feed value as perennial rye grass, but you don't need to do anything with it. it just looks after itself. It also extracts more copper from the soil than anything else because we've got to get the crop soil interacting with each other so that the only thing we don't know about is the weather. I'll talk about fertilizer a bit at the end because the whole point of what I do, which is slightly bizarre from an agronomist perspective, is very nearly doom himself out of a job. Because if the soil's working, they're communicating properly, you guys are making money, I'm happy. Uh, that's actually what it's called, by the way, edifology. It's just getting the right crop in the right place. It's not, as so many land agents keep telling me, 400 acres of wheat, rape and barley, irrespective of the soil type, irrespective of the yield, that's what we're going to do. You've got to be uh, braver, people. Something else to really think about, you're actually growing food. Uh, it's sort of obvious, but sometimes lose sight of that. And the nutritional quality of what we're growing and producing is not always what it should be. Declined significantly, I'll show you about that in a minute. Here's just an interesting thought for you. I, I quite like this little sentence. Anybody know who said that? No? Well, I was pretty shocked as well, actually. That was our, our politicians. So they have actually done something useful in the last couple of years. They are starting to think about it, but the, the issue is they don't know what to do with that. Uh, and fundamentally, we need to be working with our soils, working with our crops, because the methodology we want to adopt is farming without subsidies. We need to ignore the subsidy, and I've got quite a few farmers now that they may not be making a vast profit, but they're making a profit without subsidy, and year on year that's increasing, and the input costs are massively reducing. That's where we've got to get to. But that is, is a really profound little statement. So... This is some of the scary stuff. Uh, it's from the USDA, and it's the recommended daily average data. So if you say that our potato nutrition that we need to be getting, uh, sorry, calcium levels we should be getting from potatoes, that's how much it's, it's declined in a century. So where you've got figures of the eat five a day fruit and veg, well, we should be eating six and a half, seven to actually achieve the same amount. I think it would be quite scary, but I've been reliably informed by some interesting people I've been speaking to today that you can actually scan fruit and veg to assess the nutritional quality, and if that was then linked to any subsidy payments, that would uh, sharpen all our pencils. But that's quite scary. It, it really is. Never mind fast food. And if you can find the website, it's quite tricky to find and interpret, but they've got any fruit and veg you can think of. I just put potatoes on there because they fueled what we do now. So without potato and the Industrial Revolution, we wouldn't be here. Pacific Ocean. Wrong. Indian Ocean. It's just being mined. 
Japanese, French, Spanish, they're just taking everything out of it completely. Uh, the next world war, don't want to be too down about everything, is going to be over water supply. Nothing can function without water on this planet, particularly us. And unfortunately, access to water is going to be crucial. And if you think of all the rain we've had recently, what's the Environment Agency done? Sorry, Environment Agency, but basically, let's get it out to sea. You know, we've got to be saving more of that. And more importantly, we've got to get your soils in a condition where that they can actually save the water for your crops. So they can't function without it. Uh, this is just some, again, background data to get you thinking. Unfortunately, chocolate is remarkably high. So to produce a kilo of chocolate, it needs 17,200 litres of water. This is the bit that I do quite like, because nearly all the environments I work in are grass-fed animals. Well, we need the organic matter. So until the government or somebody in authority decides that we can actually use human waste, which is a massive natural resource as a fertiliser, we've still got to rely on animals. So apologies for the vegans. I don't suppose there's too many vegans here, but no disrespect to you if you are. But actually, getting rid of all the cattle is wrong. Getting rid of house cattle, possibly. Rice, there you are. I'm sure you can all read it. Apples are quite thirsty. I always find it surprising that all my students, because I teach up to master's degree agriculture and also train agronomists, we're forever irrigating potatoes, but actually there's not much involved in it. This is some of the scary levels that we've got to that we need to be thinking about. And the point is, ladies and gents, we can do an awful lot about that. Because if you've got a healthy crop, part of the photosynthetic process is plants absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, release oxygen back into it, and water vapour back into it. So if you've got a healthy crop growing in the right place, it sequesters carbon in the soil. And I'll explain how that happens in a minute. This is something else we need to think about, that it takes decades to create the soils we're working with now, but it's extremely easy for us to degrade them without really trying. It's a very, very fragile environment, and I know I'm preaching converted, but when you put a plough through it, you end up killing it. It's the topsoil that's the crucial bit, that holds most of the nutrients, most of the nutrient exchange. We know all of that bit, so I wouldn't bother insulting intelligence going through it, but I'll actually get on to how a plant interacts with the soil, because that's the most crucial bit. This um, uh, photographs a friend of mine who works all over the world, who's a renowned soil scientist, and that's where we started from, and in five years we ended up with that, and that was largely because the country that was in had a major subsidy for growing cotton, so they took all of the left-hand picture out and ended up with the right, which is desperately sad. The other thing to think about as well, that we're quite, uh, what's the word, enlightened about the problems with the atmosphere. India just had national elections, atmospheric in responsibility, environmental responsibility, not even mentioned. South Africa was the same. Cape Town's nearly running out of water. That's just bizarre. And we need to be getting the message out to them as well needs to be thinking about the soil and what the plant actually needs. Building facility, disease resistant yield potential, reduce the cost of production. All of these, you know, that's how we increase the gross margin. When we get towards the end, I'll give you the science of how actually a plant interacts with the soil. Once you get a better understanding of that, then you can make more surety of decisions. If you're playing God for a day, whether it's Mrs. or Mr. God, it doesn't really matter. This would be the ideal soil. So the mineral part of it is your sand, silt or clay. That's what you've been given, but you need to know what you've got and what proportions, which we'll look at in a minute, because they all interact with the environment differently. These are some of the crucial bits that within the soil you need to maintain 25% air, 25% water. It's quite difficult to achieve, but a bit of thought, planning, and it can be made to happen because Without that, you will not have profitable crops and then we won't be saving the planet. That's the other thing to think about, ladies and gents. 25 mil of water, it's an inch in old money, a hectare, weighs 279 tonnes. 
if you haven't got the structure of your soil right and allowed the crop to interact with it, then you've got a very compacted environment that definitely won't have 25% air, 25% water. Unfortunately, I started working with a farm that's uh, got a very high magnesium content in his clay, so the soil compacts very quickly, and that was three years ago. He only ended up with, across the board, on quite a big acreage. Uh, I won't tell you how much, but it's into the four figures of less than three tonnes a hectare, wrong, three tonnes an acre of wheat yield, which is not big or clever. But he was extremely pleased because he'd made a profit. Just need to be thinking about this. We all know the soil texture triangle. You need to find out what soil type you've got, match the crop to it, and then use that information to get the correct machinery to manage your soils. But if you don't know what soil you've got, you can't make the right decisions. This is the other thing that's really, really important to think about, and it moves on to what main point of what I want to talk about, but I could talk about it for hours, so I've only got half an hour. Uh, sand, it's dead and inert. There's no, no chemical charge to it. Whereas your silt and clay particles have a negative charge, so therefore they will hold on to the positively charged nutrients that we want, the cations, calcium, phosphate, which is an anion, but calcium, potash, magnesium, all those crucial factors we need for our plant to grow. And it's why historically we know clay soil always has the greatest potential for yield. It's always a pain to manage, but has greatest potential for yield. If you think of that grain of sand, and you can get 33 particles of silt in that grain, 333 particles of clay, you then take all those out and put them in a straight line. That's a huge surface area of charge that then works like magnetism in the soil. That bit at the bottom, I can't tell you how important that it is. It's not my world, but it's absolutely vital. Uh, I put this up because we really need to think about this. I know you're converted, but it always gives me a bit of a giggle because the young farmer who was trying to incorporate all his organic matter was failing miserably. His grandfather, who's only just allowed to drive, bless him, drove past, got out of the car, got in the tractor and showed him how to do it. But we need to be full inversion tillage if you do have to plough. They only have a plough, I think, four or five years in, uh, so, so one year in four or five. But to incorporate the organic matter back in the soil is quite important. We know all of that. This is some numbers that probably make you think. This is what you want to achieve. 43% in increase in water infiltration. That's because the roots are doing the job for you. If you've left the roots from the previous crop in the soil, you've got those channels. The new seed can follow that channel. Air can follow that channel. Water can follow it. The whole environment's working for you. You get an increase in water retention because you've allowed the soil to restructure itself. Earthworm biomass increases. I'll talk about the worm species, where they are and what they do in a minute. This is the important bit, that because you've allowed the soil to build back up to the level that it used to be, because graminase species were the first species that colonised the planet, which is all the grasses, and obviously wheat and barley are grasses. When a buscular mycorrhizal fungi interacts with the roots, it produces stuff called glomalin. That glomalin is a protein that it needs that releases more phosphate from the soil. Because phosphate is an anion, has a very high negative charge, it's stuck in the soil and often doesn't come out very easily, get the plants to do the job for you. Saves you a fortune. Tractability and soil working. If you're going over your land half a gear qu quicker, or even a gear quicker, I've got one of my farmers, and in fact that's the one that uh, I was just talking about earlier, where all the rainfall had, he measures and manages exactly the working power, the diesel output, and absolutely everything from his tractors. And he said the saving in money that he's made over three years has easily paid for me. We're not letting so much soil run off. If it's not running off, then it's not going down the drain, not causing a pollution incident. More importantly, the soil that runs off is taking all your nutrients with it. That's important as well. We're not losing so much nitrogen either down the drain or volatilizing back into the atmosphere. 
that's the important bit that we need to get to about saving the planet. You get an annual increase in the carbon capture. In other words, the, number, the, the level of carbon that the plant wants to use, it's used what it wanted, what's left over is sequestered in the soil, which is what we need to be doing. So just a, a few photos of, we've looked at plenty of soil pits, but just think about what you've got and find out what you've got and what it looks like. Uh, this is really interesting. I, I, I wish I'd had a digital camera. This is from, oh, crikey, early 90s, I think now. Uh, basically, it's triticale undersown with white clover. Uh, the increase in productivity in the soil was really good. The farmer thought I was absolutely mad, but gave it a go. Well, triticale is a bit of a pain to sell because when you try and sell it, merchants always tell you it's worth nothing and not five quid off a ton. But the gross margin from that crop was fantastic. We let the sheep in afterwards, put another copper triticale in, and fairly spookily, we didn't have to do much to it. Virtually no pesticide inputs at all. Just need a, a quick bit of reminders about earthworms, what they do. There's three basic types of earthworms. You've got the epigeic, the little red guys that live near the top. A bit further down, you've got the endogeic guys that are pale, a bit bigger. They go horizontally but you need to start getting quite excited when your soil starts generating the anisecic, excuse my pronunciation, they're the ones that go vertically. They're about as long as um, a pencil, dark black head, red body. They're also the ones that when it pours with rain, we tend to see on the roads. So if you see them on the roads, don't run them over, you know, put them back in the grass verges because they're creating air pockets in the soil that are allowing the microbes to work. Organic matter, we know about, but the thing is that organic matter on its own isn't actually the answer. That's got to be converted to humus, it says at the bottom. Take up to 20 years for that to be converted, so we need to be starting to think how we can achieve that now. Soil-borne microbes, absolutely vital, particularly our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, because when a plant root grows, it has an exudate on the outside. It's a slime trail like a slug. It's so full of amino acids and sugars, the microbes in the soil feed on that and in return produce masses of hydrogen ions, which I'll explain to you in a minute, release the nutrients. So instead of being bound in the soil, they're in the soil solution and then can be absorbed by the crop. This is what we want to be trying to achieve. It's measured by the cation exchange capacity of the soil, will help everything to start with. If you haven't got soil microbes in the soil and when you can now actually buy our buscular mycorrhizal fungi to put in the soil, there are probably better ways of increasing your soil microbe levels. And I won't talk too much about that because still other people's thunder, but you can't always do everything and sometimes being able to get something out of a box does make a significant difference, providing you're doing everything else in a fairly holistic approach as well. So, just to remind ourselves what we do and what the plant needs to actually work. Fairly spookily, if we haven't got rain, there's nothing dissolved in the rhizosphere, which is the root zone for the plants to actually absorb. Australia are doing some pretty extraordinary things at the moment. They're changing the genetic signatures that are in the stoma so basically when a plant absorbs nutrients through the roots, it goes up through the plants, goes up the xylem, moves around in the phloem, gets distributed around the plant, and the water that isn't required is evaporated out the top by evapotranspiration. The guard cells are the things that monitor the environment above ground and say, actually, it's too dry, we need to retain water in the plant and close. They're ridiculously slow to work. They're not very good photoelectric cells at all. Australia has done a, a massive program after the last five or six years to actually increase the speed of that to retain more water in the plant because without the water in the plant the nutrients can't be absorbed and move around the plant. All of the things we know but actually helping the plant to achieve that is really important. This is more of my world. I've got a, a couple of slides that hopefully explain it to you. The most straightforward thing to think about is think magnet because the rhizosphere in the soil is predominantly negatively charged, but all the cations that we want to feed our plants are positively charged. 
So if you think of that area around the roots is predominantly negatively charged, that's your clay, that's your silt, that's your organic matter. Sand doesn't have a charge at all. And then you've got your positively charged nutrients in the soil that are bound onto that negative area. Depending on the positive charge it's got, it depends how much it's bound in the soil. And this is a really, really important point to bear in mind, ladies and gents. You can measure that and go, oh, brilliant, we've got loads of it. But unless you help that get out of the soil by having a healthy crop, you're a bit stuck. The major anion, as in negatively charged nutrient that we need, is phosphate. As you can see, it's got quite a high negative charge, which means it sticks like to a blanket in the soil because it bounds on in preference to all the other cations that are in the soil and doesn't come out very easily. So if you've got that mental picture of we've got everything in the soil but it's stuck there, without the roots growing and without the roots growing effectively and providing the exudate, slime trail on the outside, feed the microbes, that situation will just stay there and you're not going to make money. So if we take that as our first situation, that's the slide we've got now, but the clever bit of nature, for want of a better expression, is it's a very symbiotic process. That slime trail that's got the amino acids and sugars in feeds the microbes. In exchange, the microbes produce hundreds of thousands of millions of hydrogen ions. Yes, they're positively charged, but they're slightly acidic. So once they've broken, uh, sorry, produced the hydrogen ions, that then breaks the bond for all the nutrients that are in the soil to then be liberated in the rhizosphere, in the root zone in the water, and be absorbed by the plant. If that root is not growing effectively, that won't happen. And that's the bit that you guys need to achieve to make money. Because once you start doing that and interacting with the microbes in the soil, as I said earlier on, you know, the reduction in input costs are dropping year on year on year. Yields are stabilizing and in most cases increasing. Not dramatically, but increasing enough to be making a difference. Tractability working, movement power, everything that we're doing to establish the crop is reducing. I'm getting quite a few of my younger farmers complaining because they know how to take their wives on holiday more often, or in the other case, wives take the husbands on holiday, but more time, more money, because the soil and the crop are interacting properly. That's really important to find out about your cation exchange capacity and make it work for you. So that's that little bit. I've got a couple more slides, but just to remind you, that's what we need to be thinking about, is actually your soil and how it works. If we're okay for time, I've just got two more slides to show you on fertilizer because that's really important. So, we all know we need fertilizer, certainly until we get our soils into that wonderful situation that we don't need to put any inorganic fertilizer on, but it's going to take time. We need to be thinking about the fertilizer that we put on, how it interacts with the environment and what it does. Uh, all over the UK, we've got nitrate vulnerable zones. It's a bit spooky, that. Nitrate has got a negative charge. So if you think of the negatively charged soil, two negatives repel, and if you haven't put your nitrogen on at exactly the right time, it rushes through the soil so fast, the crop can't access it. Or worse still, from the point of view of grassland, it goes through so fast that you get a lush grass and your beast scour. Uh, urea, much more stable. Yes, we know it's prone to volatilization. Well, don't put it on at the wrong time. The one that's really, really important to think about, ladies and gents, is potassium. Because you really should never, ever be using murate or potash if you need potash on your crops. Don't ever use murate or potash. The reason being that it kills soil microbes. Because when murate or potash breaks down in the soil, it forms muriatic acid, which is a soil sterilant, and it's used to kill MRSA in hospitals. It's that powerful. So we've just spent God knows how long trying to improve the environment in our soil, increase our microbes, and then we've used murate of potash. Use sulfate of potash and straight nitrogen. You'll make a fortune. Uh, if you just look at slightly more at depth, it all just follows on reasonably logically. But the speed that ammonium nitrate moves through the soil, I'm sorry that we're led by the fertilizer application industry, but we need to be thinking about much more about what we need, what your crop needs, what you're trying to achieve. 
I've got farmers that still make significant amount of money, increase their gross margin by using urea all year on their cereals, well, on everything to be honest, because they move their timing, they think about what they're doing, they ensure it doesn't volatilize, and they probably save at least one pass, so that's 10 quid a hectare they've saved to start with. So it's just understanding what the fertilizer does and not just buying things because you've been told they're cheap. Uh, this is the other thing that's really important to think about as well. Merchants are brilliant at ringing my farmers up and saying, oh, by the way, it's dropped a quid a tonne. You want some of this fantastic stuff? Oh, farmers, yeah, unfortunately, we're all led a little bit by the nose. If you just look at these prices and then look at the difference in price per kilogram of nitrogen. Right? We actually want the nitrogen. You can put sulphur on your crops, I would suggest, in much, much better forms. Well, there's a significant difference in that lot, and I'd much prefer my farmers to have the money in the bank balance rather than fertilizer companies. Apologies for anybody in the room, but that's how it is. 2010-10, uh, one of the most wisely used grassland fertilizers in the UK. Pretty bizarre. It was developed originally for potatoes. They didn't sell enough of it, so they made a story about how it's fantastic for grassland. Certainly won't be wrong, but it's definitely not right. And for the cost of it, it's not good. So that's me, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions, please shout. Yeah.